This is the Courier 13 Podcast with Warner Andrews. My goal with this show is to present conversations among filmmakers that impart knowledge and inspiration to people who are currently making cinematic content, or for those who aspire to make movies and television but don't have the know-how yet to start, or for people who are just fascinated by the filmmaking process and the entertainment industry. My guest today is film producer Stephen A. Jones. If you're the kind of producer I am, on one hand, you want to make sure that uh, you don't spend money that you don't have, um, and you 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 may have made an agreement to shoot a movie on time and on budget. Um, I feel it's fairly honorable to honor that side of the equation, but on the other side, you want to creatively turn out the uh, movie that the director has in their mind. Um, so you have to balance those two. When does something, when is something essential to the production creatively, and when is something essential to the production financially? And the, the, the job of a producer really is continually balancing those two things. Um, and then aside from that, there's the um, shepherding of the project from start to finish to make sure you get the best, the best movie uh, possible. And taking care of your people, making sure that everybody gets along and is, and, uh, and is tolerant of each other and behaves properly. Um, I, I know you've probably heard this in class. There's, there's points where you have to be a psychologist because people lose the path or forget what they're doing or forget about other people and need to be reminded that we're usually all in this together when we're making a movie. Yeah. Do you, do you think that the, the produce, it's the producer's role to, I mean, because well, I mean, I think any role on a film set, you have to understand people's emotions and mm -hmm. what drives them to do what they need to do. Um, I've always heard it said that because I, uh, I've I've only been a director and a writer for projects. I've I've never yet produced. I've but I've heard that um, the producer and I feel like it is true to an extent. The producer is the boss of the show. Do you feel like the boss when you're the producer of something? Oh, it depends on how out of control it is. <laughs> uh, okay. If it's really out of control, I I feel like I'm not the boss. I feel like I'm just you know getting dragged yeah. by a dragged by a horse. But in, in general, yes, in, in, um, somebody has to be able to sometimes step in and say, okay, this, the buck stops here and I'm telling you that this is what we're gonna do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a person that does that um, casually. So I only do that when it seems like, no, no, <clears throat> we, have to, we have to get something in line or in order. Uh, in general, I like to, I like to be the more, uh, friendly version of producer as opposed to throwing my weight around yeah yeah i mean do you do you think do you think that's even effective to be a hard ass i i truly don't believe that that's the way to get anything done i just don't i know there's people that that's that's their livelihood is to be yelling and screaming and pushing people around i just don't i can't operate that way as you know personally um so for me it's <clears throat> it's much more effective to to um, encourage people to do their best work as opposed to harass them into doing their best work. Yeah. 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 I, I don't, I mean, I share kind of a, the same philosophy. It's like, if, if I, if I wouldn't enjoy working for me or if I was in, or whoever was working under my position, if, if I was in their place and wouldn't enjoy working for me, I feel like you can't, because also when you're on a film set or when you're making something together, you're around each other so often all the time. You have to like like each other or it's just not or you have to keep going back to that feeling every day. Yeah, and, and it makes it harder. You know, you have very long hours and, and it just makes it harder to do your job if people don't get along, needless to say. Yeah. Was was uh, Henry a portrait of a serial killer your first production? Yeah, that was my first, and that um, it's the only one of um, the movies I've made where I wasn't on set the whole time. <clears throat> I, yeah. I sort of became a producer in that one by default, in that um, I found uh, the director came to me with a, a box of, of uh, index cards with scenes written on them, 
and sat in my house and said, look, I've got $100,000. We're going to make this movie about this serial killer. And <clears throat> that's what he came to my house with. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically a year later, we had Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer completed. But the editor, the writer, <clears throat> the musicians that did the soundtrack, uh, some of the actors, the art department, they were all people that I found or knew and, and brought to the project. So when we got to the other end of it, and I was also the post-production supervisor. He um, also composed, at least. And I composed the score on, with, yeah, with, yeah. Two other, with two of my friends. I was, I was sort of more the arranger, that actually in a lot of ways than the, comp but no, it was a composing job. But, mm -hmm. but ultimately when we got through with the, and I designed the titles, for example. So when we got to the very end, Mm. I said to to John McNaughton, I said, you know, I basically put this whole movie together other than finding the money. I found all of the creative right. people and I, I supervised and worked all the way through the edit and the sound mix and recording. And all. I said, so I think this is a producer credit. He said, yeah, of course. So that was a mixed blessing in that I, up until that point, I had been a director. I was a, I directed commercials, animated commercials for the most part. And, uh, from that point on, I was considered, no, no, you're a producer. And so I did it to myself and mm -hmm. that asking for that credit, but uh, I, I needed, I deserved the credit. I, I, for, uh, you know, along with John, we made that movie together. Yeah. I mean, uh, as, aside from putting up the money, you did every other yeah, I, I job. Found, that... yeah, again, I found the folks and we had a line producer, a, per, mm -hmm. a pr person who dealt with the logistics uh, named Lisa Dedmond, who, um, she became an attorney and didn't continue on in, in the business, but she handled the, the dollars and cents and all that stuff and, and was probably on set all the time. But I, it's, again, I was the only movie where I didn't, I didn't go uh, to set every day. I was doing a, so the movie cost a hundred thousand dollars and I was doing <clears throat> in that same 28 days to $250,000 worth of uh, Captain Crunch commercials. So I had, mm -hmm. a, I had to check my, my priorities were different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when because you've worked with John McNaughton several times. On, yeah, we've on made uh, eight movies. Eight movies. Eight movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No. So obviously, did you have a relationship with him prior to him coming up to you and saying, "I have this idea for a movie"? You know, it's an interesting story in that. Um, so I came from New York City when I was seventeen to go to the Institute of Design, and I immediately gravitated towards these. Uh, people in the design school, actually not just the design school, Jay, a guy named J.Y. who's in that band Sticks to this day. Oh, wow. Yeah. He became a close friend and, and is my closest friend to this day. He and another guy named Paul Petratus, they were musicians from, from the South Side. And I gravitated towards them because that was I was really into music. Having come from New York, they thought I was really extra hip because I, I knew what was going on in the, in the rock and roll business. Mm -hmm. um, so I would hear from my friends in, at, at IIT in the design school about this guy named John McNaughton, who they knew because he'd been in bands with them uh, and played on the same circuit when they were in high school, I guess. Yeah. But I, but I never met him. And so you jump forward more than 10 years to uh, John was working at this video company and they needed an animated sequence done. and and he called me up and I said, you yeah, know, I've been he listen, hearing about you for 10 years. He goes, well, I've been hearing about you for 10 years. So I did a couple of little animated pieces for this place, MPI Home Video, um, designed and directed these, uh, well, for their, their first logo and some titles for a couple of documentaries. <clears throat> and in the course of that work, uh, we, we started talking about uh, maybe making a movie sometime. And then yeah. he got, then they gave him the, <clears throat> the go ahead to, uh, to make Henry. Do you, was your, I mean, was your first reaction positive to getting that kind of script? Because I mean, because that's an intense movie. Well, there, was, there, an, was, there was no script. So there was right. a, yeah. a, a 2020 news article about, about um, Henry Lee Lucas. And when John came to me, I said, you know, there's also a Penthouse Magazine had an interview with him. And in the Penthouse Magazine interview, Henry Lee Lucas was claiming that he'd killed 360 people. Mm. Uh, most of which turned out to be a lie. Uh, so we taking that material and the the twenty the, the documentary news program, 
you know, and John coming in with the, with this little box of, of uh, index cards, I said, well, you need a writer. That was the first yeah. thing. So I had, I had worked with a place called the organic theater company. Um, they had a deck director, Stuart Gordon. They, they did the first, uh, um, ER emergency room, it, it, which turned into a TV show. And they yeah. were, uh, and they were very influential in the theater community back in those days. They were, they were outrageous. Everything they did was out. There was almost always naked people on a stage. It was just my kind of thing. And I was like, <laughs> wow. So, so I went to, to John, to Richard fire, who was one of their writer, writer, actor, directors, which is they all did. And I said, uh, uh, Richard, why don't you meet John? And if the two of you get along, maybe you can write the script. So Richard wrote it along with, with John. That's how the, where the script came from. Uh, but, but back to your question, um, I, what it didn't, it, it didn't matter what the content was, mm -hmm. you know, it was, a, it was the idea of doing this kind of a project. And I used to tell people, uh, when Henry turned out the, as successful as it did, if they'd asked us to do a fairy tale, I would have tried just as hard to make that as, as good or as cool as possible. You know, it wasn't, wasn't the subject matter and I didn't really. I don't really gravitate necessarily towards that kind of subject matter. It just happened to be the thing that landed on my on my plate. So, so do you think? And this kind of goes to a broader question, because sometimes producers sort of pick a lane, pick like a genre and a like a movies that they do. Right. For you, do you think you're you're more of whichever? what uh, when a when a just cool story comes to me i'm more going to take that as opposed to worrying about what the mood or the tone or yeah the content. I think, yeah that's exactly it i i always when people say what kind of you know i would always in, especially in those days not so much now i would you know show a film or go to an event and there'd be all these people in it or i'd be on a panel and they'd say well, what kind of stuff do you like and i'd say a good story well told that's really it i'm not particularly a fan of the supernatural um i'm not particularly a fan of uh uh of, of uh broad comedy i'm just, just as far as w wanting to work on them i'm not a particular but if you came to me with uh you know if you'd come to me with the exorcist that's a great script you know All and, right. and there's and there if you'd come to me with an animal house i would have gone okay you know i, I can if, if it's really well written then the job becomes to execute, you know, but in, but in general, I didn't, I, right. I mean, even to this right now, I have, uh, um, I've been trying to help these people do a romantic comedy. I've got a, yes. woman, a woman director who's doing a thriller. Um, another woman director who's doing a, uh, Alice Monroe coming of age of a young lady story. I have a Irvin Welsh, the guy that wrote train spotting. I have a, a book of his called the sex lives of Siamese twins. We're trying to make, so it's all over the place. Um, right. It, it's just really the quality of the material as opposed to the genre. Mm -hmm. Do you, cause that's very, again, I, I want to get into all, all of your new projects and all the things that you're working on, but I want to stick on your relationship with John mm -hmm. because it's always interesting, you know, because there's so many different types of relationships in this business, but a film, a film director and a film producer relationship is a very interesting relationship. First, I guess my question is, why do you think you and John work so well together? And what, like, what are those important things about a film director and, and a film producer's relationship that need to work? You know, I, I think we work well together because um, more than anything, we, we sort of share a certain, uh, I don't want to call it a vision, but a certain aesthetic. Um, so we both can look at something and go, yeah, I like this or yeah, I don't, or yeah, this works or yeah, this doesn't. Um, so there's times throughout all of our films when, um, although he is the director, having come from being a director myself and having a director sensibility, I'm able to say, Hey, you know, maybe we need to look at this this way, or maybe this can happen. And, uh, John can, can use that, uh, sensibility along with his own. So sometimes I've, uh, you know, steered him away from some disasters creatively. And sometimes I've, uh, uh added to the, to the, 
quality of the movie. Uh, quite often, I believe that, that, you know, ultimately I tell people I'm the creative quality control. So if something doesn't seem right to me or seem, you know, that it's working, I'm, I'm, my position with John is I am allowed to say, hey, here, here's a, another opinion you should think about. And he respects it because we've had some success. So our, you know, our relationship is that of co co-creators. I mean, there, there were times, um, Mad Dog and Glory is a really good example where because I, I'd helped, not helped, I'd, we'd, John and I sat and we storyboarded the movie, but I did the little storyboard drawings before I gave them to a Frank Coronado, who's a true storyboard artist. Mm -hmm. So by the time we got to the set, which is a year later, I knew exactly physically what everything was supposed to look like, where everybody was supposed to be, all those things, where John was dealing with uh, the script and the actors and the dialogue. I physically knew how this movie was supposed to go. Yeah. So between the two of us, we could, we could cover all the bases and, and um, we functioned somewhat as, and I, you know, I, I, tiptoe around saying co-directors but we that's we function quite often like that up until uh up until we did normal life and then after normal life i think we had a little bit of a uh, divergence for a while um until we came back to do wild things and in wild things it was much uh clearer um division between my responsibilities and john's there was a there as far as putting the movie together and getting started, I was more in a producer, producerial position and less in a creative position. But by the time we got to the end with music and cutting and all that stuff, I was back doing the, what I usually do, which is um, collaborate with him. Yeah, I mean, I, I know you're, you said that you're tiptoeing around saying co-director, but it sounds like uh, that you definitely, that though you were definitely sharing that sort of, a relationship i mean we we had an agreement and that's why i say tiptoe around it was he's the director simple simple as that and yeah. the director the, the the place where we really um drew the line was he would talk to the actors so any direction to the anything having to do with it and i would have people like ashley judd would come up and say so what do you think and i'd say you know i think all kinds of stuff but go talk to the I think director. many things. <laughs> yeah, I think plenty. But go talk to John about it. And if there was something that I thought that she should be doing different or something I thought was wrong or something I thought was great, I would go talk to John. I wouldn't talk to Ashley about it or, or any other actor. That was not my, my job. And we, that was an agreement we had um, that we kept after, again, we had some, um, we had to work that out. Yeah. Yeah, no, but... You seem to be, as as far as most producers go, one of the most creatively involved. Well, and again, it's because of my background was as a director. I mean, it's it's as simple as that. I I couldn't, I can't stand and look at something and and if it's you know, and it's again, John and I have a, a, a similar um, aesthetic, so I could I could couldn't stand and say, oh, this isn't really hard work. This is working horribly, and then just I couldn't just stand back and do that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, over the years and over the movies, sometimes I've said things that I, you know, I didn't, I wanted to do this. Or, and sometimes he'd say, no, that's part of it, you know, and sometimes he would take my advice. Um, and that, that sort of give and take is probably what's helped us a little bit as far as our, our projects have gone. Do you, do you have a, a, a favorite film of yours that you've made you know the 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 answer to that question is i always um so whenever i would go to these functions different industry functions in, in chicago um roger ebert the critic uh had followed us from henry we showed henry at the telluride film festival roger ebert came i have pictures of him with his little camera taking pictures of us. He just said, you know, I'm, I'm, this is amazing. Guys from Chicago. And he followed us all around, you know? Mm. Um, so I would, over the years, I would run into him at these different, different events. Um, and I'd come walking up to him and he'd always get this sort of puzzled look on his face and, and Chaz, his wife would whisper in his ear for a second. And he'd look back at me, he'd go, oh yeah, normal life. Now that's a great movie. Now here's a guy that knew us from the beginning 
mm-hmm. and saw all of our movies and reviewed them all very well. And the one he picked out was Normal Life. And that was like, I was just like, yeah, because for me, it was the hardest movie to make because of the time and money constraints. But it's also the one film that we had the original idea from the very start to make the movie about those events. I mean, most of our movies have been scripts that came along. Well, Henry was the first where we made the story up. Um, but the next movie, The Borrower, is a movie we had to um, adjust to somebody else's really bad script and get it fixed. Uh, Mad Dog and Glory was a perfect script. We didn't mess with it at all. But when we got to normal life, it started out, there were news articles and, and, and things on TV about this husband and wife bank robber team and it was like, we want to make this movie. Now, now somebody else bought the rights and generated her first screenplay, but it came back to us and we were able to turn it into a movie that we did. And to me, because of that, because of how hard the crew worked, uh, because of how it turned out, um, it's my favorite project for sure. But was it, I mean, was it also logistically difficult? Like were there- It was, it was, lo- it was logistically unbelievable. The sum- that summer it was, every day was 95 degrees. And most of the time we were out in asphalt parking lots because a lot of the movie in- involves the Luke Perry character moving cars around. Yeah. Um, and because we had so little money and so little time, if you had a location that was, for example, I mean, and I'm off the top of my head, for example, if you're doing a, bank robbery you had to be able to turn the camera around and the next right next to the bank had to be a graveyard or had to be a laundromat or had to be another set a lot of times you had to have three different looks on the Mm -hmm. same day right we we couldn't afford to move the entire film company somewhere else we couldn't afford the time so poor rich moskal was the location uh manager and he you know who he later became the chicago film office head for 20 years he had to find locations that he'd go okay well we got the forest preserve and the bank but there's no funeral home okay we got the funeral home and the forest preserve but we got to find the apartment he was continually having to get these puzzle pieces together um again because we we had a very short schedule and and not very much money but that's that well that's so because you got to find so you're basically looking for three specific sets, but not sets that you made, just like right, they, right. they just happen to be lo- around right. there. Three specific locations within walking distance of each other, because we couldn't move that entire circus. We couldn't afford that the hour or two that it would take to move to move the the, the uh, show. No, that is hard. It was. It was hard. That's and, not, and, yeah. yeah. And and part of it too was there was there was literally zero films being made when we made that film in Chicago. Uh, The industry had tanked um, for Chicago. There was nothing going on. Mm -hmm. And so we got just this spectacularly great crew, uh, guys that have, guys and women who've worked on the biggest shows that have ever come through here. And and they came and worked for us and they worked, I believe, um, harder than they would have for some Hollywood people that came in because they knew they knew who we were. Mm -hmm. Uh, They did actually come up to us at one point and say, um, you know, this this L.A. guy is has really pulled some awful stuff on us. You know, he was one of the people working on a show. I won't pick up, pick him. I won't rat him out. Yeah. And uh, they said we would have walked off. And this is the this is the main people in the crew. We would have walked off if it wasn't for you guys. We just want you to know. So we went and straightened it out with the LA guy after that. It was like, okay, hey pal, <laughs> you can't do that to our guys, you know. Um, was it like pay? Like they wouldn't get it paid? Was, it was it was a time issue. They mm-hmm. this this person was um, nickel and diming somebody who he should he should have really been so incredibly grateful that they were working at all for us mm-hmm. uh and and put a spy in their crew i just just you know just, just stuff that was un, just unnecessary right uh, everything was going fine and so again so our department heads came and said you know we, we would we'd be gone already but we we respect you guys and we'll continue and and so we we straightened that out I mean, that's it's good that you were able, able to strain that out. Yeah. Um, wh- why do you think, because I mean, I always, 
I always wonder this. Why do you think it's so it, for at least for for a long time, it was so difficult to have any productions going on in Chicago. And even now, you know, we have this kind of renaissance, but it's now just starting to come come up. You know, there's a couple of factors. One was always it was the weather. Um, right. Well, you know, yeah. Uh, so that cuts down your your shooting exteriors, obviously. Um, two was until Cinespace started, which is, I think, less than 10 years now. <clears throat> we just had two stages. So if you had a big production and big productions, uh, for example, we'll, we hardly ever shoot on a stage, but we've had most of our movies. There's a period of time where you need a stage for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe three, depending on how big the picture is. But if there's only two stages in your city, it can handle one movie yeah. production. Mm -hmm. um, there was also a point in time where the labor unions were um, not as transparent, let's say, and not as, uh, they didn't, I'm, I'm not, I don't wanna accuse anybody of anything. They did not feel as honest as you would want coming mm -hmm. into business. So for example, we had a movie come in where we were gonna shoot it in Chicago. And once they sat down with the labor union in those days, it's a long time ago, it's 30 years ago more, they felt threatened um, and that they wouldn't have control of their own show. So they pulled the movie to the West Coast. Uh, that's all changed. I mean, we have so much work now and we have really good people in, in uh, IATSE and, and uh, the labor unions that that's not an issue anymore. Um, but in those days, the reputation, even if it wasn't true of the city was that it was kind of crooked. Well, and yeah. You're gonna pay an extra cost to make a movie here. And, and you know, that's not good for, for anybody. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think I heard it was true that like Richard J. Daly, the mayor was like not cool with like, movie productions like oh yeah did, no, that, did not welcome it and after uh the blues brothers they uh they they really clamped down you couldn't uh, and you couldn't use chicago police logos or or police cars or anything like that until we did mad dog and glory mm -hmm. and we were able to we were able to uh charm younger richie into into rescinding that order by we took um robert de niro and bill murray down to city hall oh wow and we went to the mayor's office and 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 hung out with Richie for a while and and told stories and cracked wise and he said oh yeah go ahead use the use the stuff use the cop cars and use the uniforms it's fine that's how that's how you're able to convince them you brought in like your two best actor your two biggest biggest name actors I guess I mean yeah. that, that makes yeah, sense you know and, and and when you're from Chicago and somebody says Bill Murray wants to come to your office you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, man, come on, come on. Let's and take, yeah. please take pictures. Mm -hmm. so there's pictures of us standing around in Richie Daly's office. Well, that's that's awesome. How how did how, how did that movie come about? Mad Dog Glory. How did that? Uh, come about? So we had done Henry, and we had done this movie, The Borrower. But the Borrower's uh, company that had done The Borrower, the the uh, Atlantic Entertainment, uh, yeah, Atlantic Entertainment they'd gone out of business. <clears throat> so the borrower disappeared. Oh. And someone showed Martin Scorsese Henry. And in the, in the back of his mind, he was like, wow, this is, you know, this is even creepier than what I do. So he, he, uh, he had a script by Richard Price, which was Mad Dog and Glory. And what wow. he told us later on was, he, he said, yeah, I figured I'd take this crazy guy that did this Henry movie. And I take this sort of sweet script that Richard Price did well it's a sweet script with some dead people in it though still right you know yeah. and you know but it is a character study it's it's you know a, a cop who wants to be a uh an artist and a, a gangster who wants to be a stand-up comedian and so marty said i'll put these two things together and uh he got because henry was well it was because it was marty he was able to get Universal Pictures to agree to do it. And it was supposed to be a small budget. So not, I mean, not super small, but it was supposed to be a lower. We were going to do it with, for example, we were already picking. We'd use Malkovich and we would use Joey Mantegna, all local guys. We'd do it for, you know, $7 million. And to, that, to us, that would have been like, wow, man. Because we made, <laughs> made a movie for hundred grand and another movie for 
two million dollars so like oh, seven eight grand were you know and uh marty said well i want i want bob to look at this and we were like bob oh bob okay robert <laughs> Shapiro. yeah so once bob had a look at it and said he wanted to do it the budget went up to um almost 20 million dollars Mm. And uh, but but again, it was because Marty thought, Mr. Scorsese thought that combining our sort of really um, you know rough, morbid uh, aesthetic yeah, yeah. along with the script, which was which was a little more light, the two of them would be a good blend. Mm. Do you think he was right? Oh, I think he was right. Yeah, yeah. I think there was you know we had a. Uh, the only real, we had some issues ultimately when we tested it that that um, affected how the movie got uh, got finished. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I think that we always, it got to the end of the original script was just a little bit too much of a fantasy. And we were able to change that um, before the, before it was ever released. But I, 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 I'm very proud of that, of that film. Do you, do you, Cause you, yeah, cause you did, I mean, you did Henry and the borrower for low, low budgets comparatively. Yeah, Henry is a hundred grand. The borrower was, I think, 2 million. Right. Somewhere in there. So um, you, even back then, would those have been considered low budgets? Uh, they were, yeah. Yeah, uh, Henry, yeah. Was, Henry was low budget no matter what. Uh, the borrower was, 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 yeah, low budget. Even there's people that when we did Mad Dog and Glory still thought that was low budget at, at, at yeah, 20 million dollars yeah um what what changed it did anything change into your approach of making the movie as it, like say like you transition from the borrower to mad dog and glory did your um way that you went about producing change because you had so much more money at your disposal well, well one of the things that happened comparatively was i had, a, I, had yeah. a, I had to learn what what the job actually was because of my background, I came in just as we've discussed already, messing with the creative aspects, mm -hmm. and not not you know even in, even with Mad Dog and Glory, we got to a point where I was uh, you know I'd go to the rap party and a guy would come up to me and say, "Hey, nice to meet you. I, I was the lead man, and I'd have no idea what this person, what their job was, who they were, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I was still dealing." up with the creative stuff with the actors and with the sets and what, and, and didn't know still how you actually produced a, a movie. Um, so, so we had, uh, we had uh, Marty's wife at the time. Um, uh, she, she was the, the primary producer and then we had a line producer and I was left to do what I always do, which was, you know, mess with the creative aspects of it. And, and uh, I had to then learn what the, what the rest of the job entailed, you know, um, and it took some, it took some doing. So you, you had like learn all of the logistical, legal, financial, all of those things. And I, and, and I still didn't even particularly learn them on that job. As, as we went further along, I would pick up more and more of it. Um, but, it, but initially I was, I, I didn't have a clue in a lot of ways. That that I think that's a very important thing to note just in your career and your your journey in this business. Like I think it's good for other people to understand. It's like you learned on the job, like you yeah. learned more and more as you were going. You you didn't like, you know, you weren't like uh I knew everything on my first job. Right, right. You know? Cause I th I think that's nice for filmmakers to you know, because I feel like some young filmmakers feel like intimidated because they feel like they have to know everything on their first well i can i can tell you from from personal experience that um not so much producers but somewhat producers but directors for sure i've made five movies with first-time directors and most of them i won't say all of them so they'll no, none of them ever know who i'm really picking on right they they the minute that director's hat puts on them it has all of the knowledge in the world and on the hat so they know everything and they know everything and guys, guys and women who've never directed anything are telling me this is how it works. Um, and that, that's, that's a, that's a weird position to be in. Let me tell you, you know, 
if, if the person whose word is last word says, <clears throat> I know what I'm doing and they don't, you have to figure out how, how to negotiate around that to, to get the best, the best work done. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's, that's gotta be the most, I mean, I, I, I don't know it necessarily yet from the producer side, but that must be so annoying to have, I guess the leader with the director is kind of right. like the leader right. on set to be right. like, to be a little ignorant on something perhaps and not, and not feel comfortable admitting that. I mean, like I had, that? I had, an, and <clears throat> whenever I talk about this in class, I always have to preface it by saying, I don't think this person was a bad person in any stretch of the imagination, but I've had directors who were, um, <clears throat> who, came from somewhere else. They weren't Chicagoans, they, I hadn't worked with them. And they would feel that I was trying to take over their show mm -hmm. when I would suggest somebody to work for them. Um, and I suggested an editor on one of our shows. I said, use our, our editor, Elena Maganini. You, you should, she, she cut Wild Things, which was anamorphic. She cut Mad yeah. Dog and Glory. She cut all of our stuff and she will work cheap on this movie that we were trying to do. And the director just wouldn't even talk to her on the phone. And within six months of him not hiring her, she won the, she won the uh, Emmy for cutting, cutting Dexter. So, mm. and there was an actor, Michael Shannon, who everybody knows who Michael Shannon is. Right. And, I'd known now we know. yes. and, and I had, uh, we needed a, somebody for a day to play a really specific hard ass part. And I asked Michael if he'd come in and read and he did. And uh, the director said, no, nah, he's not right. And, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's like somebody, somebody brings you an airplane and you go, nah, that's not right. And you get on your bicycle, you know, he, <laughs> He, That's a good way and, to put it. And, late, yeah. and later on, when I ran into Michael Shannon, he said, man, I thought I had that job. I said, I would not have asked you to read. I would have just given you the job. There's no question. <laughs> there was, yeah, there was no, yeah. You know, and, and within six months of him being turned down by this particular director, he was nominated for the Academy Award. And way after the fact, I said to the director, you don't understand, I'm not here to take over your show i'm here to make it better yeah i think he got it sadly he got it after the fact mm -hmm. um it was like i you know i have no i have no reason to to do anything other than to, to make it the best picture possible which is the description of the that's the job description you know make yeah. the best picture possible for the money you have um but uh, again that was a first time director they they weren't going to listen to me. They were from out of town. So they thought uh, they were told by somebody else, well, don't let these people run your show. It's like, well, no, we're not running your show. At that point, do you just have to swallow that as a producer at some point? Yeah, you, because you, you, you can't really bang heads. If, if, I guess it would be, well, you can't really bang heads with, with the person that's direct, especially if you're, you know, if the person's directing the movie. You can't. I mean, you have to figure out a way to negotiate your way through it. Uh, and ultimately, uh, I was able to to do that. But but uh, s sadly, without some of the <clears throat> you know, some of the better cards I had in my hand, I couldn't use because the director refused to use them. So that so the people so you you brought up you brought to this director's attention these great assets that so you I brought had. I brought these a list literally assets right. yes and he what he recognized was that means this guy's trying to control my my process that that that's that's what the the, the director took it as yeah and i'm assuming that the people that he did get, the, his choices were not the, on the, the same level the, the choice for an actor he did okay he did okay. Uh, he didn't. He didn't do better because you can't do better than Michael Shannon. You can't. <laughs> you can't. I mean, the, yeah. I mean, especially for that right. particular role, you could not do better. Mm -hmm. The guy he got did did fine. Yeah. Uh, for editor, no, he failed miserably. 
and it caused great delay in the movie getting made and it caused uh, real rancor between the financiers and, and the director and there was, there was lawsuits involved and all this stuff. It's going back to the fact that he, he couldn't, didn't know how to choose an editor. Um, but again, it was the first time director. They uh, don't know how it works. Hmm. Was the I mean was the editor and I, I obviously we're not going to name any names. I don't want to get too like so, he, like, so he, involved. No, you don't have to. So the editor, if you looked at the credits of the biggest movie the editor made, the first mm -hmm. one that he chose, yeah, uh, he had one really successful credit. Yeah, the director on that particular show never used the guy again. Hmm. So. And he had no other good credits. And because it turned out the guy was not really an editor, the, whoever the director was on that show probably directed or dictated directly how to, how to cut it. <clears throat> so uh, when that guy got hired, he, between him not really knowing how to edit and the director never having directed before, the movie was a disaster at first. And then, then we had to find a different editor who was more um, skilled and pay out more money. Was that so? Was that then a different editor? Or was that the editor that you had wanted? We ended up with it. Ended up going through three editors. We got to one who was a, a real, the real deal. Got it. And again, I'm just assuming it's it's one to not. I, I don't bring up who and what it is and all that because right. it's, it's uh, it actually turned out pretty well. Uh, as a movie um but it, it certainly a, can it, it, if, yeah. if you redirect the the direction you it was a mess can. it was a mess there for a while did um oh what was i what was i about to ask you oh do you think i mean when when you hire people especially if you're going to hire someone that you um haven't worked with yet mm -hmm. How important is, like, what, how do you figure out if that person or that individual is up to the task of joining on your production? That's a good question. I mean, what, you know, I go back to the harvest, which you made about eight years ago now, where we, um, for a lot of reasons, one being Michael Shannon, being in New York, being in a play, we had to go make it in New York. And we couldn't import a lot of people to work on the show. Uh, and so it came down to the, the, basically to the interview process and, uh, looking at the person's work and, you know, on, on uh, pre previous projects. I mean, we literally sat in an office and we had a big screen with Netflix on it and we would, you know, people would suggest different folks or their agencies. And we would look at the person's name. We'd look at their IMDB credits and we would go, we would then screen some of their movies and, and say, this kind of is the what we're looking for and then interview the person and if it seemed like you know we were seeing eye to eye then we would hire them and that was really the process for all of the creative department heads so uh you know production design costume um editing uh cinematography uh those are all hires that we made by through that process of looking at you know looking at different people's work and and interviewing them Mm -hmm. And interviewing a number of people and choosing, choosing one. What, when you, when you found someone you liked, what, what tended to be the reason that you were gravitated to them? Was it their work? Was it their personalities? You know, it was a combination. It was their work, their personality, and their thoughts about the, the script. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it's funny. We were making a movie. Um, it was not with McNaughton. I was making a movie that, that Michael Keaton was directing. And we would have, there are not a lot of, certainly not at that point in time, a lot of production designers in the city. There was maybe, mm -hmm. there was actually one who was the go-to go person <clears throat> and, and he was tied up. So we were interviewing these people to come in to be production designers and they would all come in and they would sit in Michael Keaton's office and go, yeah, yeah, I can do this job. And I was, and we were getting closer and closer to needing a production designer. And I, uh, I called a friend of mine, a, a producer named Peter Newman in New York. And I said, you know that little, and we didn't have a lot of money. We had, by the time, we had 4 million bucks for the production. There was more for the cast, but 
And I said to my friend, Peter Newman, um, you did that movie, The Squid and the Whale. Um, and I really liked the production design on that. And I know you didn't have a lot of money, so I need to hire that production designer. And he said, no, you don't. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, because that person didn't do the job. It was the person under them, the art director person mm -hmm. did the job. <clears throat> so I call, I, well, she's in Germany at this point in time. And we were literally, we're, we're, we need the person in, in a week. We have to have a person hired. And uh, I get a hold of this person in Germany and I say to her, you know, we're making this movie. Here's the script. And the next day I'm getting images. Here's all oh, it's it's Christmas time here. Just just like a lookbook, just feels of things, colors and and mood and setting and stuff. And I walk into Michael Keaton's office and I say, "Here's her. Here's who we sh we ought to hire." Mm -hmm. um, you can't say, "Here's who we're hiring," because you don't do that to director. You let the director pick. I said, "You know, you've interviewed five or six people. They've come in your office. They didn't have shit to show you." <laughs> somebody in Germany who's turned this stuff over overnight because she wants the job and I, she comes out highly recommended and he went okay let's hire her and we hired her you know uh, it had to do with you know her she was thinking about the movie and thinking about she wasn't thinking about the job she was thinking about the movie you know and and mm -hmm. and what it's what it should look like and what it should feel like and giving us something to tangible that I could take to a first time director and say, Hey, look, here's somebody that's thinking about your movie already, you know, as opposed to guys sitting there going, yeah, I can do this. You know, I've done TV commercials. I can, I'll, this will be fine. It's like, no, no, I want, we want the artist. Right. You, you want the person who's gonna, who's going to immediately get it, get an emotional connection with the story. Exactly. Right from the get go. Cause exactly. that's, those are the, that's going to be the good stuff. Do I mean, is your philosophy with 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 hiring because that's so much of what a producer does, like getting the right people for the right job. Right. I mean, our final project was all about that, about right. that element of it. Right. Exactly. Um, do you, uh, when you're looking for people, do you like go on their IMDb and look to see if they've like they've done multiple things with a specific person or with a specific group of people because if people have hired them multiple times, then that's a good sign that they are worthy of being brought on to things. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the considerations. And also we try to talk to people who work with them because mm -hmm. you don't, you know, it's a mistake. I, it's a mistake I've made a couple of times was not talking to enough people who the person had worked with. And then when the person uh, didn't turn out as well as I had hoped, as far as what they were, their working or their uh, personality, um, it was because I didn't talk to enough people and, and find, get to, and do what we call due diligence. I didn't go mm -hmm. and say, okay, the first person I called who was recommended said, oh, he's, he's the greatest. Well, I should have called three more people because I bet the other three would have said this, this don't hire him. You know, I, we had that happen mm -hmm. a couple of once or twice before I learned my lesson that you have to, you have to, it's one thing to see they're real. And, and a lot of times people can not be the uh, be as honest as they might otherwise be in their um, in their credits. I mean, IMDb is certainly a good place to go and look, uh, mm -hmm. but even then, you can you can uh, falsify your credentials to a degree. So you need to talk to other people and and see what the person really. It's for example, like the person who was the production designer on Squid and the Whale, and my friend said, no, 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 no person who actually did the work with somebody else <clears throat> you know it's something to be considered right because just that that one tip gives you the right is the difference yeah. between getting the right person getting yeah. someone's like yeah. not gonna even totally the right thing. totally would have been a totally different movie wow do you, does that ever i, I mean obviously you you've done so many films that have been successful and have worked out does that even scare you anymore to find the right people at this point you've created a, a catalog uh, you know no it doesn't it doesn't scare me because you know as you say part of partially is the experience in, in my age and having been having you get to a point where you trust your own instincts and your own uh artistic sensibilities and go that looks good 
I've talked to the person. I'm not getting, you know, I'm not getting creepy vibes off them. <clears throat> but yeah, it, and then, but still you have to do the follow-up and make sure that you, you're hiring somebody who's not, you know, a, a thief or a hatchet murderer. <laughs> Yeah, that 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 that, that, would, that would be pretty bad. That, 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 would, that would that, that would be a job. Great. If there's a job, that's something. If, else. Yeah, no. If they were like an extra, <laughs> and that was what their whole thing was, that'd be great. Um, do you, th- this is something that I've actually talked about on other podcasts, and I and I now wondering kind of where you stand on it. Like, do you think, and specifically from the from the viewpoint of a producer, um. Although I guess, I mean, since you, you do a lot of directorial things and you've composed and you've helped with the okay. edit, like you, you can come at it from multiple angles. But like, do you think that, um, do you think that filmmaking, being a filmmaker, being an artist, being a creative, do you think, is it more important to have a great like knowledge base or is it a lot of following your gut and figuring out how to be in tune with your instincts? Uh, You know, from a creative standpoint, it's really gut. I mean, an instinct, I mean, it really is, Um, you know, quite often we've, we've made a decision going, I don't know if this is going to work. And it, and it works because we instinctually found the right Mm -hmm. sound or the right picture or the right image or the right person. Um, But you got, you know, it's a balance though, I'd have to say. Have there, I mean, I'm sure there's been a ton of moments where, like you just said, like you, you, it could have been a huge decision that would have completely changed the movie or completely altered the movie. And you just went with kind of like your good decision. Does that happen often? Um, no, because you don't, you know, you, you don't look at the what ifs. You, you, you look at what you've got, you know. So I don't think about a lot afterwards. Or what if we'd gotten, you know, in the case, that case with, uh, um the where they didn't choose the editor who who really should have been chosen our editor elena uh that was a big that was a big what if how, how much better the picture would have been had they at, not only would the picture have been better it would have gotten done quicker it would have uh there wouldn't have been all this animosity between the director and the fi- financiers all of these things would not have happened had the director uh uh, trusted me at that point yes. in time. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's no getting around that. There's, th- that's one of the few times where I said, boy, what if we'd only had, you know, this other circumstance? Most of the time it's like, no, no, you, you find this person and then you go. You know? Well, a lot of times it is, it is the only option. A lot mm-hmm. of times there are just, you're just kind of put in a corner and yeah. it's like, yeah. this is it. This is where we got to go. I mean, and a couple of times here, it's changing now because the industry has grown so rapidly here. But a couple of times in the past, there was really one person who would, in some of these creative department heads, th- th- there was one person who was way up here and then there wasn't anybody else. Mm-hmm. And you, you took that person. I'm thinking about specifically Sue Kaufman, who was a, a, a costume designer. And um, so I'm not speaking poorly of her in any way, but she, right, no, yeah. she was the only one. And fortunately for us, she was the only one because she did uh, um, she did the promotion for us. She did, I think she did drunk both for, for and I don't say for us, I mean, McNaughton, those are not McNaughton pictures, but three or four mm-hmm. pictures, Sue was the costume designer. She's doing all of the Chicago Med, Chicago Fire. She, she does them all now. She's the, the costume person. Right. So, so as I say, so luckily for us, the only person we could go to in this city, um, and and part of that is financial. You can't fly people in from everywhere and put them up and give them cars and do all this stuff on low budgets. So you, you would try to find somebody local. Fortunately for us, the local customer was a superstar, you know, and and it was the only our only choice happened to be the the, the superstar. A great choice. It was yeah. a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's funny that you brought up the promotion um, because that's the promotion is I feel like I mean I know you're I know you definitely uh, you know we were talking about like the fact that you don't have a specific genre or type of content that you go to but 
I don't know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I do feel like you kind of do go, you have an aesthetic, I feel like, that you Yeah, do. I try. I, yeah, I, yeah. I try to inflict the, the people I work with <laughs> with, my, with my aesthetic. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, but do you think his promotion, I feel like, is, is kind of different from that a little bit, perhaps? Mm -hmm. um, do you, did you, at that point in time, when the, when the opportunity for that movie came, did you, did you just feel like you wanted to do a comedy like that or something like that? Or. So at that, at that point in time, I had been working with, um, with Steve Conrad, the director, writer, director on, on, we had a, actually had a company together we had offices and all that stuff. So we had a bunch of different things in development, but his, his, um, uh, style is that very offbeat strange comedy that's just that's who he is everything yeah. he does is is at the base of it as serious as it seems you look at it a little and go wait a minute that's the, those are the oddest choices where anybody mm -hmm. else would have gone straight or made a right and conrad's gone left that's just who he is you know mm -hmm. so having worked with him on we did a he did a very small film that never came out and then he was working i think Beyond that, he had a bunch of, but I was in, we were across from each other in the office for a year. So mm -hmm. I, I, I saw all the variations of that screenplay and where the story idea came from and everything. So by the time we got uh, the money to do that, I was all in. I was like, no, no, this is, this is, um, I understand what this is. I understand what, um, what it should be like. And, and for all intents and purposes, it was Steve's first uh it was his directorial debut but he had done a smaller little tiny film prior mm -hmm. to that yeah so so you know it was all in that case again it was almost like the choice was well here's what our company's doing now let's let's go do it and i having again been through so many permutations of that script and helped hire all of the people that were involved uh for me it was um it wasn't like some weird decision i had to make it was it was what we were doing you you said that you knew pretty pretty immediately how the story should be from 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 reading the screenplay and scene and like when he gave you that idea. Oh, you mean for the promotion? For the promotion, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I can tell you in, in hindsight, uh, having we hadn't um, in hindsight, you never know what things are going to be like when you're working with Steve. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's just got the oddest sensibility and he, he, he makes decisions that, you know, you have to say, I'm okay, let's go. You know? Um, I, I mean, I, the story was the story and he's mm -hmm. a very good storyteller. So, yeah. you know, if you could break that movie down to, you know, a log line, then it would, it would make perfect sense. You know, a, a guy promised his wife, a guy promised his wife that they could buy a house because he was getting a promotion and he was lying to her. Yeah. That's, 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 that's that story. And, yeah. and he's, he's competing with another guy who's come in from Canada. And, you know, that's the whole story right there. And so for me, it was like, okay, yeah, that this, we, this, this is what this story is. And, and then it's got all these weird, funny quirks in it. So, but I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is like, did you, do you have kind of a tendency to, be, whether it's because you've watched so many films, you've, you've, you've consumed so much stuff, like, do, does every movie that you come on, do you have a preconceived notion of like, this film is going to kind of be like, I'm just talking to had Lawrence of Arabia, it's going to have oh, that kind of feel. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I like that you bring that up because we, I, I have uh somebody who's been asking me, well, we've been talking about me directing something and they keep saying to me, well, he, and it's a genre. It's again, it's, it's a, a genre, horror genre, which I'm not particularly fond of, but again, if something's well, really? written, that's, that seems funny to me. <laughs> just, I don't want, again, if it's, if it's really well done, mm -hmm. if it's the exorcist, if it's um, uh, the Bruce Willis one, you know, there's, there's, there's some, but I won't, if, if you give me a list of movies to watch, the horror one's going to be not, not going to be the one I watch, you know? Gotcha. Um, yeah. So I've been approached to direct this one. I said, sure. Cause if you say to me the word directing, yeah, I, I say yes. Mm. Because I can, uh, you know, and, you and I'll do that. Right. Um, 
but you know, what was the question? I've, I've lost myself. Well, because we were talking about um, like, do you always have oh, okay, okay. like this movie is going to be like right. this? Or, so you know. so the, the person that asked me to direct this said, so here's here's all the movies you should go and watch. And I said, I won't do that. I said, we, I've never made a movie where we went and looked at other movies to to to. Oh, really? Clean things okay. from. Yeah. We, we we may be in the back of our mind or remember that scene in such and such a movie, but uh, and um, I, Steve Conrad is a guy who will uh, certainly on the promotion he watched we what we sat and watched a bunch of other movies, but it was more for choice of cinematographer and stuff like that. It wasn't for storytelling. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, for me, for better or worse, I'm not saying it's the right way to go. I like to just think of what I think it should be like and not base it on, well, you remember that shot? And there's a couple of times we stole shots from other places. Um, mm -hmm. The very end of the bar where the very last scene, the guy's driving along in an ambulance and there's a, there's a, the alien has come alive in the back of the van. And the last thing you see is this explosion of blood and it just completely covers the windshield of the, of the ambulance. And that I will admit to having, having stolen from one of the alien pictures where the alien got into the spacecraft. And sure. But, yeah. But other than that, I, I didn't go back and watch the alien to see it. I just remembered. Oh yeah. yeah. So for me, I, my, what I see in my head ultimately is the movie that I, I essentially I directed, you know, like when you read a book, you know, you're, you're directing that, story you're it's the images you have in your own head so for me it's more okay now let's go put those images together uh and hopefully you, what you hope is that the, that's what the director is that the director is going to do yeah no that's 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 in, that's very cool to know because i feel like and i feel like it's with me as well, like when I'm writing a screenplay or especially when I'm writing a screenplay or if I'm like directing a scene or something, I'm not, you know, it's always in hindsight that I realize that I was being influenced by something. Yeah. yeah it's I never mean, like on the onset right, of it right. that I'm that, like, oh, it's this movie right. that I'm thinking. Yeah. That's influence as opposed to, um, you know, lifting it or, or borrowing it or paying an homage to, I mean, fucking Quentin Tarantino it's his movies are about other movies you know it's, it's this shot from this movie and this shot from this movie and this it, it for me it was always like there's not uh the originality is is <laughs> in a lot of ways how he how he puts them together but he's just referencing one movie after another you know and to me it becomes a little soulless when you do that um but that's his method, and it works fine for him. He's done. He's done quite well for himself. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean, his movies. Yeah, his. I mean, I I definitely enjoy a good Quentin Tarantino film. Um, it's. I mean, they're they're very. I think well written. But it is true what you're saying. It's like, I I saw this like video about like about Quentin Tarantino movies, and it was funny that the person made the comment like, Quentin Tarantino has done that very rare thing where like he's taken shots from other movies and now we think those are his shots yeah. like 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 uh the the shots which i mean i'm not that's not like an attack on Quentin tarantino right right i mean he, he, he's yeah, being he, influenced by right, those right. by those by those great films like the search searchers and and mm -hmm, stuff yeah. like and then like that specific shot is what i'm referencing like in the searchers there's that shot where she's walking through the door frame and it's all dark inside and then you just and he does the same thing in glorious bastards and right. that's such an iconic and that's be like from my generation of people who are growing up watching that that's like their searchers that's like right, right. the iconic exactly. use of that exactly. shot yeah right but yeah no and of course he he always goes into goes into um before he does i mean at least from what i've heard he goes into productions watching a few films and then yeah and make that. and and having his whole cast watch whatever those films are yeah i mean but again that's his process i'm not i'm not not and i can't certainly can't knock his success no uh, it's not and some end. of his pictures i've really liked and some of them i thought were just abysmal you know but you can say that about anybody's movies you know nobody does oh, yeah. one perfect yeah. perfect film after another I, I have a silly story about quentin so we were in <clears throat> john and i had done mad dog and glory and we're in nottingham they have something called shots in the dark festival and it's half 
um, thriller, dark kind of movies, and half books. So you'd have uh, James Elroy and people like that, um, uh, different writers. And then you would also have these movies being shown. So we were there and Quentin was there with, um, with the first, with his first movie. And uh, that was, uh, Reservoir, what Reservoir, was it? Dogs. Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. yeah. So, so we meet him. And he was like this, he was like the kid you wanted to beat up in high school. He was this really nerdy guy. He went to the Robin Hood Museum in, in, in Nottingham, which was a uh, Woolworths that they turned into the Robin Hood Museum. And he came back with a little hat with the feather in it. And, I mean, he, he, just, <laughs> he just was like this little nerdy kid, you know. The photographer comes along and he takes a photograph. And a year later, one of my friends, a production designer says, man, you're not going to believe this. You're in this book. I said, what book? He says, well, it was filmmaking of the, in the year. And I can't remember, it was 93 or whatever, but it's a whole book. I, have, I actually have it on my shelf. I should have brought it up. And he goes, there's good news and bad news. I go, well, what's the good news? He goes, well, you're in there. It's you and McNaughton and Tarantino sitting on a step. Mm. I said, well, what's the bad news? He says, they called you Steve James. Steve James. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who did Hoop Dreams, you know, and the guy who, who's, who's the very successful documentarian, you know, I think he's been up for the Academy Award. And and uh, I told that story to, to Steve James, and he goes, well, you know what? People always come up to me and tell me what a great movie Wild Things was. I go, okay, so uh, I, don't feel, yeah. I don't feel so bad. But, but still, I said, I can't even show that book to my mom. It doesn't have, it's not my name, you know? All yeah, right. No. <laughs> you, I mean, did you, did, you, did you go like the publisher? Did you write to the no, publisher no, and be like? No, no. no. It's, just, yeah. it's, it's actually it's a, more fun this way. I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of a funny story. It, yeah, it, I, have I mean, a book on my shelf. I go here, look at this picture. And they go, oh, is that Tarantino? I go, yeah. I go, look who's sitting next to him. Steve, Steve James. Steve James. <laughs> who is Steve James? Oh wow, that's funny, man. Uh, what? Okay, so now I'm glad that you brought up Wild Things. Because I think Wild and Things, you you spoke about that film a lot in class, and I, and I saw that film and I really enjoyed it. Like, where 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 did you come up with that idea? Who came up with that? Okay, so that's that's one where, um, and that's actually right. That's the movie after Normal Life, and when yes. John and I John and I sort of uh, parted ways for a while after Normal Life because we'd had, <clears throat> well, I mean to be perfectly frank it had a lot to do with there were that we were sort of in this co-directing space and he didn't want to be there. He didn't want to do that. Okay. He yeah. wanted to be the director. Um, it. It's kind of a, it, an interesting story in that. So we parted company and I went off to actually, I went to London because the, the people that do James Bond had a small movie that they were seeing if I wanted to direct. And I went over there for a while and <clears throat> he went to the West coast and somebody gave him the script for Wild Things, but it was uh, just a cartoon. It really was. There, yeah. It was just a sort of a, but the, all the plot points were there, um, and the character names and the story was there. But it was a, so you was, and you were able to you did you and John both recognize that you said I, this I script isn't that it. great. Oh, I didn't. I didn't even see it yet. And finally, I think when he sent it to me. He said, yeah, but I've got this, I've got the studio to agree to let us rewrite it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So we hired our friend, a guy named Cam Nunn, who's a, uh, not a great novelist, really one of America's great novelists. And, and <clears throat> he'd written another screenplay. Well, actually we met him because we wanted to make a movie out of one of his earlier books. Yeah. So he rewrote Wild Things. Uh, and in the process of rewriting it, they, it, it, they ended up doing scouting in Florida and they came up the character with Bill Murray with the neck brace actually met a guy who came out with that fake neck brace and all that stuff and it all got incorporated into the screenplay but initially it was a, a you know a, a typical um, Peter Goober Mandalay pictures they get all these scripts they saw some value in this particular one they hired John they asked him if he wanted to direct it mm -hmm. um, they could not make a deal with the whoever they had on the Sony lot who would have been the pr producer. Yeah. So they they had a um, guy who's a line producer kind of kind of line producer guy um, go to Florida with John to start the movie, and then they had no other producer. They didn't have anybody else to do <laughs> to 
there was a big job opening with nobody in it. And they, <clears throat> um, John called up and said, and this is truly, we hadn't spoken in months. He says, you have to come to Florida and help me make this movie. So I call up the people at the, at the studio and I say, okay, I'll come out. You can interview me. They go, don't just go, go to, mm -hmm. go, go get this thing done. You know? Um, <clears throat> and when I got, got down there, we had to sort of, um, figure out what the new dynamic was since he well neither of us wanted to be in the position of being at each other's throats you know trying to make the movie so we discussed what the new dynamic was I went to the line producer guy and said you know you got to bear with me because I don't know exactly what my role is going to be this time and he was like oh yeah don't worry I've already been dealing with John I know what your <laughs> I know mm -hmm. what your job's going to be already you're going to have to be the person that carries this thing along with the studio, with the actors, with John, and and that became my job. I still ultimately became the same guy that sat next to John and and discussed every last take with him. That's what we. That's how we do. Um, and again, sometimes he would say, "Yeah, you're right." Sometimes he'd say, "No," you know. That that was our. That's our relationship. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then we get done with the shooting, and we go into post, and we pick the. You know, we, we look at the different cuts and we pick the uh, composer and we go into the sound mix and all that's all stuff that I participate in. Uh, so the only real division was in the sort of uh, perception of my role became, okay, you're not this, this, there's no way there's two guys doing this. There's just, there's just John. Yeah, I, honestly, it's, it sounds like you guys are just co-directors of this one. Like, <laughs> yeah, but, but again, I, I just ask for trouble if I even say it. I don't. Right, know, well. I don't mind. I don't. I truly don't mind. At this point in my life and in my career, I, I don't mind. And and when mm -hmm. we were making Wild Things, Peter Goober, who used to run Sony at one point, but now he's got his own uh, production okay. company, Mandalay. Yeah. He said, it, don't worry, man. It's not the screen credit. It's the bank credit. That's what he said. Bank credit. <laughs> and so, it's bank you know, credit. And that's a, there's a movie where I got paid, uh, for, for me, not for, not for Hollywood people, a stupid amount of money, a really nice, giant paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, that was, and we turned out a really fun movie, a cool movie. That, there, I don't have any, uh, there's no downside to that experience at all. It was, it was a, uh, a pleasure to have those kind of tools because of, they were paying for them. It's a pleasure to have that kind of cast. Uh, it was sort of a, a relief in one way to work the situation out with McNaughton to where we were we weren't going to be again we weren't going to be tussling with each other and and uh, we got that sort of straightened out. So that was that I fond memories of that movie. Oh, I'm sh I'm sure, yeah. Um, and did. Did that revitalize your relationship with John? Do you think that felt? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it absolutely did. We we uh, at the end of that one, and and true, we got done with that one, and I was still like, well, I don't know how how you know we at, when we were doing normal life, we had a company together, an actual you know business, uh, yeah. and that went away, and after the end of Wild Things, I still didn't know what the where we would be at, and but it, but when we we had a sort of a celebratory dinner with the composer and uh and john said well what, let's let's see what's next but we're you know we'll, let's we're back to making movies let's go and then we made um we made speaking of sex in the year 2000 mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> he didn't make a movie for until the harvest it was like 12 years he did some yeah. tv and stuff but i did Drunk Boat, The Promotion, The Merry Gentleman. Uh, I think those are the ones I all did. In the, I did those all in the meantime. Yeah. Why? Why? Why did the Harvest bring him back? Uh, that was the first, really, the first, um, the first picture that he got that was a go. That that people said, "Yeah, we're going to do this." Mm -hmm. And and all these movies, because of you know a lot of different reasons, us being here and and you know not having a Hollywood presence and all that stuff, uh, you you're, you're continually developing projects, um, but you're trying to get the one that reaches critical mass, <clears throat> which means somebody's going to pay to make the movie. And the Harvest is the one that came up in rotation and reached critical mass, par partially because John forced the issue. He 
<clears throat> there were two New York, <clears throat> two, <clears throat> excuse me, two New York producers who were very young and inexperienced who had this script. And again, like, like um, Wild Things, the script was horrible. But we brought the writer out and yeah. we sat with him and we said, here's the problems and here's, here's some solutions. And he went back and he straightened the script out for the most part. Um, and the producers had a, some kind of a relationship with Michael Shannon's manager. So they were able to submit it to him. I was able to leave Shannon a message saying, hey, you know, McNaughton wants you to do this movie, take a look. When Shannon said yes, that started the ball rolling with us being, you know, ultimately finding financing. So, so that movie, it was go, we, we went and made it. Uh, mm -hmm. John didn't have that in those 12 years up to that. He never got one that got, got the go. Mm -hmm. so and, me, and me as producer, I was able to uh, a bunch of times in the city run into people who were going to try to make a movie uh, drunk boat being one, the, uh, promotion i was in business with mr conrad the merry gentleman where <clears throat> i was the guy that could get a movie get it made not get the money but have it come out the other end and you, could, you could assemble all the other parts <laughs> yeah, and have essentially it be, yeah and have yeah. it be decent have it look like a movie you know mm -hmm. um but john didn't get anything like that until until the harvest is the harvest based on a book no, Did that adapted no, original, okay, that was... original screenplay. A guy named okay. Stephen Lancelotti wrote it. Okay, yeah, because we, because I mean we read multiple drafts of that, right. and the first draft was you know there was a lot of stuff in there that was interesting that needed to, <laughs> you know the need yeah. to be changed, yeah, yeah. and then right. Do you? What's I mean? Do you have like? Because obviously getting the script ready in pre-production, that's all one thing. And production is all one thing. And post is all, the, right. they're all three very different things. Absolutely. Is there one you enjoy more or have you learned to just, I like all of them for different reasons? No, that, that would be the answer. I like them all for different reasons. I think, uh, yeah, for different reasons. In, in, in the, <clears throat> let's say once the script is in shape and, and that's, that's, you know that's always an interesting process but once it, and you're into prep there's all that hiring and starting to imagine what what it could be mm -hmm. and then and then in production is production you know you're you're grinding through but there's there's a um uh, you know a, there's an honor to that and there's a you're working a hard job you know right, right? You're, you're doing the thing right yeah. and then in post you're refining you know and you're polishing and polishing and that's a process of polishing um, I like them all, but I, you know, my, my favorite thing is having it done and sitting in a room and going, okay, there, there it is, you know, here's the, our little jewel and trying to forget all of the stuff that was a problem. <laughs> well, this, I mean, there's so many problems. I mean, that, that, that's the thing. It's like, there's so many problems with a movie or a script before it gets to that, you know, place. Yeah. It takes, it takes a while. So, I mean, you have to like. At least for me, I've had to almost while while I'm in the moment writing a script or doing something, like I have to like sometimes disassociate myself from the end because if I think so much on the end, it's like then the problems that arise seem so annoying. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so right. like and like why? Why is it like this? <laughs> yeah. And and with and yeah, and with revising scripts, it's that's very much that's very much key or that that's a really important aspect yeah, of that. Yeah. Do you, cause you, I believe on your IMDb, you have a writer's credit. You, you know what? It's, it's funny. I, I, it, I don't, I, I should address it. I have not So <clears throat> after wild things, these guys who'd been dancing with me about doing something or other. And I would say, okay, I'll whatever. And they had these really awful projects. And I'd say, okay, I'll direct one of them. And they go, you're not, no, nah, you're not qualified to direct. <laughs> After Wild Things, all of a sudden I was qualified to direct. Don't ask me why. Sure, sure. I was a producer. But anyway, I, I, I was happy to take that. Yeah. And uh, they say, here's a script. And they bring me this. It's not, it wasn't really a script. I mean, it, it, it was pages and there was dialogue, but it was not, it was just atrocious, you know. Uh, but there was a good a, a good story idea in there, a really good story idea, and it was a real. And I still think somebody should make an actual movie movie out of it. So they go, "Would you come with us to the 
meeting and you and we're going to propose that you direct this movie it was about airplane races in uh, reno or it was actually yeah in reno initially <clears throat> so i go to this meeting and it's a guy who's just left corporate blockbuster who's you know had, can get a hold of tons of money and the writer of the script and they say so you want to direct this i said yeah but you cannot direct this it's not really a script um and they went well what do you want to do about that i said will you tell me i said i'll write it i'll rewrite it's a rewrite mm -hmm. um if you pay me and they they hemmed and hawed and and finally they said okay we'll we'll pay you to rewrite it and i rewrote it and it and i i to this day i believe it really turned out well they never raised the it, the minimum it needed was was $10 million, 12 million. Yeah. I think we were looking for $12 million. <clears throat> but the guy who wrote it was a swell guy. The guy who wrote the original horrible script. He was a great guy. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I talked to him this day. And I, I had made this little speech. I said, um, here's the thing. You, you guys pay me now. And I write it. And I'll always answer your phone calls. I said, but, but if you don't pay me, you're not going to get the money to raise. You're not going to raise the money to make this movie. And I'm going to be the only guy that worked and didn't didn't get paid. I said, so make sure you pay me. So they paid me. I still talk to this guy 20 years later. Um, but I also told him, look, if you can make this some other way, you go ahead. Well, he got $2 million and directed it himself. Mm. Uh, it, it bears no resemblance to what I wrote. Oh, okay. <laughs> but so he took your revised the, script of, and then the three clips on IMDb, two of them are from this movie where they he cast a, a wrestler and a Playboy playmate as has his leads. Yeah. And it's just it's not what I wrote. You know, the things I wrote uh, are very little and he had to he had to adjust the screenplay because one guy put up some money and needed to be in the movie and you could see his airplane. So there's the movie stops where you see this uh and again i give him total credit he finished a movie which is a lot of work you know but yeah. he finished a movie that has nothing to do with what i wrote but i had the writer as a matter of fact we were i think about it now we were making uh the merry gentleman i'm sitting in my office i go on the imdb page to see if the merry gentleman's been listed because i never mm -hmm. list these things so I, I don't even know how they get on there to this day <clears throat> i put my page up and it says writer i'm going what wait a minute i didn't even know that they made a movie out of this thing you know, so so I had to call the guy up and go, you 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 made the movie. You was, actually yeah. did it. You actually made it's, the movie. Yeah, I got like a million and a <laughs> half. And I was like, oh no, if you got a million and a half to do this airplane race movie, it's not. It's oh not. yeah, no, uh, that can't. I mean, I've not <laughs> seen this movie, but now I'm actually intrigued to see how they pulled it off. Yeah, it's not good. And, oh. and, and any any, and not that I'm saying I'm a great writer, but I, needless to say, I've made a bunch of movies. I sort of know how it's. You understand, how, you understand how a story is supposed to go. <laughs> the the uh, ultimately any nuance and any thing that I had written in there that would would seem like human beings, you know, speaking that that all that all didn't didn't go. Mm -hmm. And again, I still I love the guy that made it. He's a he's a great guy. He's not a movie director. Um, and, but what but does again, he do? I want to scrub. I want to scrub those scrub those clips off of imdb because they're just so bad you know? oh my God. <laughs> uh i mean i didn't see those clips when i was yeah. on there so maybe Go they back took to them down see him it's reno i think it's called reno gold or no something. no i do yeah no i do i because i saw the, the writer cred and i was like i believe it's thunder under reno and I, yeah and thunder like, over reno that's thunder that's over it. reno yeah that that's it yeah um and it was a good, again, it was, it's like any of the movies that, that we did do that did get made. The premise, the premise was really great. This guy's flying a um, crop duster for his dad. They're dirt poor. They, they, they're, they do crop dusting. <clears throat> yeah. And, but he's a guy that wants to do something else with his life. And I think he, in the, in the, he wanted to teach, he wanted to be a teacher of some kind, mm -hmm. but he's, he's a, he can fly that plane like nobody's business, you know? Yeah. So somebody comes and recruits him to race in the Reno air races, which and which are scary. They're uh, old world. They start out with old World War II planes. They they cut the wings down to they almost can't fly. They put these they soup up the engines till they're the fastest uh, motor driven 
airplanes in the world and they fly them. And if, if the motor cuts out, they just fall like bricks. I mean, that's all true. That's the, they race. And every once in a while, people, people buy the farm, you know? So, mm -hmm. so this kid in the, in the, in the screenplay gets recruited to fly one of those. And he doesn't realize they recruited him to lose. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's going to, he's going to go, they want him to lose, but he's not going to lose because he's, he's a winner, you know? I mean, he's, he's got the skills. And <clears throat> in the midst of that, his dad croaks and he quits and goes back home thinking, you know, his, and he was at odds with his dad because he left the business to fly. And he, he uh, his dad croaks and he goes, he goes, okay, I quit. I'm going back home. My father died. I'm done with this nonsense. And he gets home and this little kid opens up the drawer and says, your dad bought two tickets to the race. We were going to come and see you which turns his head around. He goes back and he wins the big race, you know, blah, blah, blah. But really nicely written. No, I shouldn't say nicely written. I wrote the fucking, really, uh, <laughs> really nice yeah. plot. Yeah, that's why, yeah. You know, no. nice, decent. And so I- Sounds interesting, yeah. I was, no, and I was thinking at the time, okay, I can't do it. Let's go to Jerry Bruckheimer, somebody who can mount that kind of a, a, a production. You Put know, that together, yeah. It's, it's, I, I think it's still possible. Um, but anyway, well, I'm sorry, before we go on, I'm, I have to ask you, do you think that you'll find your version and then try to make that? I, I mean, I'm not actively doing it, no. As a matter of fact, I'd have to go, it, it's it's not even on a drive. I'd have to go uh, scan the original. It's a it's a hard hard paper document. It's a hard copy, you know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, that'd be, I, I think that'd be cool, though, if you did. I mean, I'm not, I'm sure... Because I know you're working on other things right now, but maybe you know in the future. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. I mean, it, and a lot of times with these, with any of these things, of which I have tons, sometimes it's just a spark, and all of a sudden you go back to it, and, and you know, I, I continually get excited about this movie that uh, McNaughton and I got asked to come and do um, a movie about how the Hell's Angels motorcycle gang was formed, mm. <clears throat> and it was actually formed by the Hell's Angels squadron who fought for China in World War II. And they, they were fighter pilots and they, they demolished the Japanese Air Force. And then when they came back, they didn't get the GI Bill. They didn't get any money because they were fighting for China. They were civilians. They weren't considered soldiers. <clears throat> so, and, and in real life, these guys came back and they became, they formed motorcycle clubs, not gangs. There was no criminal activity, mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> as they went along, somebody, you know, they got more and more criminal influence. And by the end of our little, our little, our big screenplay, they're forming the more outlaw version of the Hell's Angels. And uh, we had Kem Nunn, the same guy that wrote Wild Things for us and who's a great novelist. Uh, we got called out to Hollywood to see if we want to do the movie. We said yes. And, um, but it needed a revision because the, the ending of the movie, as it was written, the protagonist. Oh, <laughs> there's two guys and one is one wants to go into the Hells Angels and one doesn't. And the one who does goes in the bath and says, could I borrow your gun? And he goes in the bathroom and he blows his brains out. This, this is the end of this big giant movie where you got World War Two and you got motorcycles. And at the end of it, the one of the two. So on our way out to LA, I said to John, let's just tell him we don't think the guy should kill himself. Yeah. And we got out there and we said, and we, yeah, we don't think he should kill himself. And they were like, okay, you're the guys. You can, <laughs> you can make this. And they made us a deal with uh, TriStar Pictures. And uh, we, you know, and Kem came in and did a rewrite and we'd already had really big time. We didn't do it, but they had big time guys write the first couple drafts. Uh, Pete yeah. Dexter is the one I'm thinking of. Kem does a rewrite. And it, ultimately, they never figured out how to put it together. And that was not our thing. They, they, these guys looked at me and said, so can you get Brad Pitt? And I'm like, can, can I get Brad? What do you mean, can I get Brad Pitt? I, 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 you guys are the producers. You're, you're the studio. You're supposed to say, hey, we got Brad Pitt. Not, can I get Brad Pitt, you know? Um, and and it, it went away. And there's another silly story in there is, you know, they make lists of actors. Mm -hmm. And on the list of actors for who should play the leader of the Hells Angels, one of, and this is, this is what I use as an example of how strange Hollywood is, was Michael J. Fox. 
<laughs> it's like, yeah, he, that motorcycle outlaw, he comes, that he comes immediately to mind when, when, uh, that way that, that was who they recommended. That was one of the guys on their list of actors. Really? You should be considering. Let's see. Brad Pitt, Michael J. Fox. Yeah. you know. So Neither of those guys. I mean, <laughs> I could, I mean, I could see Brad Pitt. Well, well the, the, playing something like that in the character in had to context be, there was so one was a pilot who who'd been in all of these dog fights and killed lots and lots of of uh the enemy the other was his mechanic mm -hmm. so when they get back to the west to the united states the pilot's done he wants to get a a, a girlfriend a wife a girlfriend and he's done with being any rambunctious killer but the mechanic who didn't get any action he's fired up about this whole motorcycle gang thing and you know being a badass and that's sort of where the tension is in, in the in the whole story mm. so it would have made sense that that brad pitt could have been the guy that okay i want to be back to being a regular a regular guy you know it, yeah it, it made sense at that point but anyway that's a it's a long time ago as well that's another one where like the airplane script i have it in my basement as a hard copy in a stack of scripts that that you know you could go to probably go to uh tristar whoever's got them now and say okay we want to make that movie and you'd have to pay some of their development costs and they must have they must have spent a half a million dollars developing that thing <clears throat> but to me it'd be worth a shot that's another one to be that know. i mean that that sounds like a really good cool it was a, it was and it had it had, and especially now it had uh um japanese it had there was a whole through storyline about the japanese americans who were incarcerated during world war ii um it had a lot of a lot of stuff going for it. i mean yeah that was yeah why because this got me thinking do you think it didn't work out because you guys were Chicago based. You know, I think coming there's, in? there's probably there's certainly some of that. I mean, we are careers as they were. Um, part of it was being Chicago based. And initially, if you're really successful, it doesn't matter where you are. The, right. you know, they'll, they'll, and, and we had points in time where we were successful enough to where they say, come on out, let's talk. You know, for example, that movie, it's like, oh, these guys did these guys did um mad dog and glory they're obviously players come on out and, and pitch us how we're going to fix this movie which we did you know mm -hmm. um, but not being out there continually and continually glad handing and and net networking and all that stuff <clears throat> on one sense yeah it may have affected our our careers but on the other hand it kept us from uh going into the machine and just turning it cranking out you know whatever you know and i always would say to the students <clears throat> you know i'm not going to look down upon i use an example we ran into some friends of ours in la at one point where we were doing i think we were finishing up mad dog and they were they were writers and they were walking down the street and we said what are you doing and they were they were hanging their heads i said what's wrong with you he said well you know we're writing something well what are you writing you know two kids from chicago you're writing a in hollywood what are you writing is that we're writing Super Mario Brothers movie. I said, man, this the is an soup. this is an industry. You know, hold your head up. You're doing work in the in the big the big business. Don't be ashamed. You know. On the other hand, I don't want to have to make a movie like that. You know. <laughs> I, sure, sure. Yeah. You know, and and uh, so there's there's that part of it. It's like, well, there's the industry, and then there's the artistic side. You, what you're trying to do is is work your way into a position where you're able to be as creative as possible, but still be in, in the industry. And it's yes. probably a little easier to do out there. Had we had, for example, Mad Dog and Glory done huge box office, it would have been a different story. We would have, we could have worked out of here for 10 more years, making movies that size or bigger. Um, but it didn't, it didn't do the box office for God knows lots of different reasons. Um, so we had to struggle to get the next, the next show, you know, and mm -hmm. the next show was normal life, which uh, was completely mishandled by the people who, who were supposed to put it out. Uh, they sort of turned their back on it. So then we had to struggle to, to get the next one, you know, because we, we didn't, until we got to wild things, we didn't hit anything that was big enough to, you know, to make our names. 
do you was there at ever was there any point in time where you were in LA like lived there well I had to live there to post uh, you know we we shot uh, the borrower out there mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I was out well I was commuting for that one because I had a commercial job but I lived out there for about half a year doing I, I lived out there before I was in the movie business when I just got out of school I was trying to be a rock and roll drummer so I lived I lived I moved out there and uh-huh. did, <clears throat> But then when we did Wild Things, I lived out there for about six months while we did post production on that, and we did a we shot additional scenes. So that was uh, I lived out there then. So I had no, uh, I mean, one of the things about my career was I didn't start feature film making. I was already thirty five, mm-hmm. so I wasn't a kid that got out there and like I'm going to go to L.A. and I'm going to go to Hollywood. I didn't care about. I had been in L.A. enough to go. Okay, I'm. You know, I don't have to be out here. This is not a place I necessarily want to raise a family. Um, so my our editor Elena, she moved out there and has thrived. Um, so it's a it, it just depends on what your what your mindset is. So I didn't. I had thought when we were after we'd done Henry, the Borrower, and probably Mad Dog too. I had thought if we were going to make a movie, would have gone to New York, which is where I came from. I was thinking that that part of the industry as opposed to the Hollywood part. <clears throat> John, on the other hand, he moved to he moved to LA for a few years and, and lived out there. Mm-hmm. And then came back. Is I mean it seems I mean it seems for all intents and purposes though that you can have a successful career and not live in Los Angeles. I if think that, so, if that is your search if that is your so choosing. Yeah, I think, well, and then again, it goes back to, but you have to do something that is successful. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the, you know, a lot of, a lot of Hollywood and a lot of movie making general is risk for, for the big companies and for people is risk management. So Mm -hmm. if their choices are to hire a person who made a mediocre film that made a bunch of money or a person who made an artistic triumph that didn't do any box office, they're taking a mediocre person. It's just, and I'm not saying that we are or aren't any of those things. I'm saying sure. as, a, as an example, the the box office ultimately is going to be what what gets you more work. It's just the way it is, you know. Uh, and I and I used to say that because we did Henry and it was successful, they would bring us in and give us these things and then say, but but you're not doing this and this and this and this. And it was like, well, they just want. They think they can make soup, chicken soup, by holding a chicken over the pot of water, not actually letting letting the stuff work, you know, not mm. actually let us do our job, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's been so many times where we've they said, well, here's so here's how you're going to do it. It's like, well, no. So here's how why we're not going to do it. You know. I mean, you got to be at some point. You have to be. They have to hire you to do what you. Do what you do. What you do. That's why they hired you. Universal was a great example of that. We did Mad Dog and Glory, and they said, okay, we're out in the corporate uh, lunchroom talking to the the head of production of Universal, and and it's just a real weird scene because Chris Rock comes to the table and and, and says hello, and LL Cool J. I mean, just, you know, the Hollywood thing. And they say, yep, you guys, you, 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 did what we thought you'd do. You you did the job that we knew you were capable of. And so now we're going to talk about how we're going to fix it. <laughs> and, you know, and they'd done audience testing and the audience wants, wants something in their minds. And which film was this again? Mad Dog and Glory. Mad Dog and Glory. And the audience wanted something different than what we showed them, at least in the minds of the studio and the test audience. And they had us make some adjustments. Um, and we made those, but it gave us the chance also to to do a better ending. So I'm not partic- totally bitter about it. Oh yeah, uh, but, you know. You- yeah, I remember. I remember you talking about this this specifically. I mean, I feel like this was like because overall, what are your feelings towards screen tests? How do you feel? Uh, overall? I don't. I don't care for them at all. I I just don't find you know from from our experience um, that movie in particular. We got a score. We went back and re, a year later and reshot a whole bunch of stuff addressing the concerns of the test audience. Mm-hmm. Recut it, broke our editor's heart because she then had to work 
side by side with another with a, a, a more successful, better editor. He wasn't better, but he was more successful and great guy. Sure. And I'm not knocking. Yeah. But yeah. they put a supervising editor in so that she had to work under this person. Um, the scores were identical a year later. Really, it had no bearing on the, the test scores. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, and you know, and they tested uh, our movie Normal Life on an audience of people who were coming to see Luke Perry because they thought it'd be like 90210. Mm, and they got and the it's lowest. Not, and it's not at all. <laughs> he, you know, they both blow their brain, get killed in the end. It's like the audience hated it, you know? Yeah. Because they didn't, they didn't recruit the proper audience. And once they, once the audience hated it, they were, they turned their back on releasing it, you know? Um, <clears throat> we tested the promotion and uh, Bob Weinstein came out of the, out of the, audience saying we need 30 more fucking jokes well that's to me that's like well that's not how you make a movie you know you know you know, have a chart with how many jokes are in your movie but he, he said i'm the guy that had the midget kick the other guy in the balls in bad santa i know what i'm talking about it's like <clears throat> that's not that's not what we were playing steve conran was not planning that kind of humor okay. it's not that yeah. you know but a lot of that comes from you know it's it's that's Again, it's risk management. Like I said about them hiring the person that's made the money. <clears throat> well, go with the test audience as opposed to your gut or as opposed to having any sense yourself of what's good or what isn't, you know? <clears throat> because they wanna be able to say, well, the score said, the test said, the box office said, they have to have things other than their own, um, their own knowledge and, and instincts to go on. Looking at like, yeah, because because I mean it's it's interesting because screen tests I feel like it's kind of like a it's kind of like a fifty fifty whether it helps you with it. it doesn't help you yeah and and if you sit in an audience one time and and listen to these people all of a sudden get uh, uh, validated into so that they can say whatever they want about your movie <clears throat> by the end of the focus groups which they have in the screen testing they're rewriting your movie and redirecting it for you you know. And that's that's sort of hard to take too, you know, um, and that's all part of the testing process. So for me, again, they they there's movies that become wildly successful because of the test testing process, and I've seen movies that were just god awful that had tested through the roof. You know, it, it's not a necessarily an indicator of 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 quality or of anything that's going to help. You know, it's hit or miss. Do you think that comes from like sometimes a producer or studio exec, exec will, you know, like in the case of the Luke Perry thing, people were expecting to see Luke Perry from 90210 and they get a whole different thing. Yeah. Do you think, do you think that's problems arise where, where the heads of a project get too invested in like trying to guess what, how the masses will take <clears throat> something in? You know, I think for, for it's a more complex situation that it's the that movie got made because Luke Perry was a huge star, and he and uh, so Spelling, who run, who did nine hundred two one zero, was willing to put in a little bit of money, and New Line, who uh, who had done Luke Perry had done a rodeo movie for them, eight and a half seconds, I think it was called. They put in a little bit of money. Um, and then when we got it done, New Line said, well, we'll give it to Fine Line, which is our art house section. Mm -hmm. And the woman running Fine Line said, no, I passed on this script when it was a script. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And that, that we were dead in the water because of that. They didn't want to release it as a, as a movie. They um, put it out uh, on cable which was, and it was, that was a brand new thing then to run movies on, to <clears throat> have a movie come out on cable before. And the first day, millions of people watched that movie, which never would have happened if it was a theatrical release. And so that's sort of like where I learned my lesson. If you don't want to have, if you're not concerned about having your name in a movie theater on a screen, if you're more concerned about people watching it, as we know now, now it's completely changed. Everybody watches stuff on TVs on you know at home yeah 
Um, if you're interested in how many eyes you get on your project, well, cable and TV is, is going to do more good for you than, unless you happen to do Avatar, you know, or, sure. you know, Star Wars or something. Um, so I think that, you know, all along the executives are always just trying to find um, some something that they can use as their basis for making their decisions. That's not <clears throat> instinct. It's, it's, well, here's the numbers, you know. Uh, because I feel like when you're it, when you when you're in a position like a studio exec, you can't. It doesn't seem practical to you to make instinctual. Instinct. Right, and there's there's some brave ones, you know. And, and again, that doesn't mean you can make the the most brilliant, beautiful, artistic, heartfelt movie in the world and have nobody. It just the, the audience just doesn't respond, or it never gets to the audience that it should have gotten to because they didn't know how to market it. We've had, you know, a couple of our movies, they didn't know how to market them. It's perfectly, um, <clears throat> I'm not making it up. They, when we finished Mad Dog and Glory, they said, okay, uh, maybe we can get Bill Murray while he's talking about Groundhog Day to talk about our movie. It's like, what, you know, why yeah. would you do that? And, and they, when they did the post, the initial posters, they had them clowning as if this was this lighthearted movie. And I said, well, what lighthearted movie has a kid with his brains blown out in the first five minutes? It's, that's not what our movie is, you know? And which means they never went out to the audience that probably would have made that movie more successful. Um, they just didn't, they didn't know who it was. Uh, Normal Life was the same situation. Again, they, they tested it in front of a 90210 crowd. <clears throat> The, their marketing guy literally said to our face, well, let me think, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, natural born killer. He's listing these things that had no bearing on the movie we made, you know, and th that is, that's the angle I got to use. <clears throat> you know, you're left in the hands of, of marketing folks who, who for the, for the kind of stuff we do, they didn't, they never got what the pictures we made, you know, um, and that's, that's the, Again, that goes back to had we been really successful and made a bunch of money on one of our shows, we would have been able to dictate that a little more. We always had to, uh, we were always at the behest of the studios for, for those kind of decisions. I mean, yeah, but, uh, but also at the end of the day, though, you have been able to make the, the movies that you have made that are, have become successful and well known. Well, yeah, and we, we, you know, we, we are, are stubborn. Yeah, <laughs> John, well, that's, it is, and John is more stubborn than me, even that, you know, when it comes to it, it's like, no, no, we know what we do. No, we're not saying we're the, we're not the greatest artists, artists in the world, but we do know what we do. We do know how True. we, how we do it and how we got the, the movies that we did get. We do know how we got to those, <laughs> to the end. You, 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 you have a vision. Well, you have a understanding of what it is you want to bring to the table and right you know, and what it's and like. what it's supposed to look and smell like when it goes up on the screen you know we can sure that, that you know i always go back to when we made henry and we had some stupid stuff in henry stupid things <clears throat> but by the time we got it finished those scenes were gone they were cut out we cut out everything that didn't smell right, right you know uh, what we had that, left that, all, that is what post production is. It's taking out yeah. all the crap that you put in. Yeah. So, and that was, you know, a lesson for us. It's like, and as a producer, you say, well, wait a minute. That was a day's work. And now it's on the cutting room floor. So, next time I read a script, I'm going to be looking for those kind of things, you know, and you don't, get, you don't, you still don't get them all, but you, right. you start to say, well, it oh, has a lot to do with redundancy. Anything that's the same, and you'll find in screenplays, they quite often, <clears throat> like scenes that, act like scenes that function in the exact same way the exact same way but they, they, they may be two different characters but it's telling you the exact same you're getting no new information mm -hmm. and when you do that you the audience starts to to get moved back because they, they, they've already heard whatever it is you know and it's, right. again it's not specific to the language but it's no it's this is the same you're giving them the same information again they don't need it uh when you can recognize those in the screenplay then you don't shoot them. <laughs> and right. Then, you know, and you're like, no. <laughs> we had an example, and I, and I hope Mr. Conrad, hey, if he ever gets word of this, won't, won't be angry about it. But, but we had uh, the very end of the movie, the promotion, the, um, 
the two characters sit down on a bench and they they talk about everything that happened in the movie. They sort of, you know, revisit the whole movie by t- verbally. Mm-hmm. And I said to Steve, this, this, you've got, and I can't remember, how, it was like seven pages of, of dialogue saying, well, I, you know, then I shouldn't have done this and I shouldn't have done that and I shouldn't have done, I said, this is, this can't, we can't do this. And he was being forced by the Weinstein company to continue to write, right up until the first day of production. Mm-hmm. So he never went back and, and read, and, and <clears throat> took a new look at that. Um, and I, again, I'm not saying I'm so bright, but it was seven pages of two actors talking at the very end of the movie about the movie. It was not, it, anybody could see that it, we, need, we really needed to get rid of it. We didn't. And when we went to shoot it, it was a hundred degrees that day. And, and uh, Sean William Scott's in a wool suit and, and uh, John C. Riley's in a three piece and they're sitting out there and people are dying. It was so, so hot out there. We could only, we got half the day done and then we had to stop because it, people were just literally gonna drop dead. That was the day, of course, that all the studio executives showed up. <clears throat> um, to make a long story short, those seven pages, which should have been, you know, five, six minutes of, of movie, mm-hmm. was cut down to 30 seconds. Right. And it makes so all, sense. Yeah, and, 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 and it made it work. So, mm-hmm. so yes, we, we recognized in the editing room, but it had been recognized in the script form, but we were never able to get there and adjust it. Uh, we, could have, we could have got an extra shooting day had we not had those seven pages in there. Yeah. Um, but again, Steve was under the gun and they were, they, were, they were beating on him to revise the screenplay. So we never got to the point of where he was able to pull those pages out. Well, that's, and that's in many, at least from my, as a screenwriter, from, from that perspective, that's like one of the cardinal sins. Of, of writing a screenplay it's like never to never restate what the audience already right. knows or has already right. been exposed to right and that was his first you know real feature film so he he was you know and he was the writer director so there's another whole level of well yeah uh, and even great writers and directors that happens yeah. you don't even realize it yeah of course and not. Then you have and, to look back and if you have you know, a separate writer director sometimes you can one can you know, one can say, oh, you know what? Well, yeah, but, but when you're doing them, and I always say that the writer directors will quite often, not quite often, it's, well, sometimes they're satisfied when the actors say the words that they wrote. And sometimes that means they, they're neglectful of simple understanding, diction. Sometimes they're neglectful of emotion. Sometimes they're neglectful of, of uh, um, how the words are are put in a sentence because well no, they're saying the words that I wrote. I'm the director, and they don't. They're not stepping back, and as a director saying, "Oh, you know," they're like, "No, no, I'm, now I'm the writer," and they're saying what I wrote, you know. And sometimes that distinction gets foggy, which causes uh, things to slip through the cracks, performance-wise. Like, so you're saying an actor like an actor will say a line and people are kind of seeing that mm, the phrasing of the line or how the line being said yeah. isn't well, working yeah, but yeah. the director well, this is, isn't right this isn't how humans talk this is a you can hear the writer uh, or a relationship between a couple of characters just seems off but they're both saying the words so it it, it it gets past the director because the director wrote it i mean i see that happen i've seen it happen i not certainly not always but every now and then it's like well what's the reason that that was didn't work it was because the the director had turned into the writer for a minute it was just what was just listening to the words being not even listening watching the words being spoken that they wrote right right they're, they're not yeah because i think it takes another it takes it's one thing to just be watching a scene you know in you know, watching it behind the monitor and seeing right. that all looks right. But then it's another thing to be listening to what the actors are saying and being like, wait, is this believable? Do, is this at all? Does yeah. this relationship make sense? And when, and when I when I talk to um, students, I, I, I stress that you can sort all that, a lot of that out in rehearsals. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And the nature of the film business, especially independent film businesses, 
first thing that goes out the window is rehearsal. They which is which is the the worst thing to go out. The worst right? thing, in the, and it's one of the first. Then I always say all to my classes, and you've heard all this. They 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 rehearsals and shot listing are the things that go out the window. It's like, well, no, no, no. That that that's your that's entire movie, like right? Two of the most important parts. But everybody, else, no, no. It's production. We got to get the camera. We got to get the sets. We got to get location. We got to get blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Got to get her back up, and and make sure your your actors are all doing in the same movie. Uh, and and then I I. I've seen it where a friend of mine brought a movie to my house one time that he directed and, you know, direct, it's a lot of work to direct a movie. It's just a lot of work. It is. Yeah. Work. And I'm looking at this movie and half of it was a romantic, I don't want to say romantic comedy, a drama, a romantic drama. And half of it was a comedy about gangsters. And I'm looking at him and go, what's, what is the story? He goes, well, uh, there was never a rehearsal. There was never a table reading. So mm. the guys in the in the mafia scenes didn't know what the love story was about. The people doing the love story didn't know what the mafia, how it was being treated. So the mafia guys were all in a, a comedy as far as they were concerned. Hey, you know, Joe. And the other two were straight. They were playing a straight love story. And when you cut those two together, it was a horrible mess, you know. So I'm trying to visualize this. So it's like these two stories are we're cutting back and forth between yeah, these two stories. Right. right. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's exactly that's, right. It that's yeah, work. that's you it got just it. They, didn't work. they have to be the actors in the different they all have to, have to be aware right. in the peripheral of what At the other some point are. you want as many of your actors as possible to sit in the same room and say their lines. <clears throat> so right. everybody around the table, uh, our movie Speaking of Sex, which is a comedy. We had everybody in that room. We had Bill Murray and James Spader and Jay Moore. Uh, I, don't, I think Catherine O'Hara was there, Lara Flynn Boyle, but all around the table. And at the end of it, you could see Bill and Spader both looking at each other like, oh, okay, so this is, this is the movie you're in. Because Spader was the lead. You know? And Spader said to me, you know, I was, was kind of uh, you know, freaked out. I'm in a, a Bill Murray movie. I said, no, 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 man. <laughs> You're the lead. He's in the James Spader movie. And he, he looked at me for a second. And that was it for him. He, 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 and then he understood what it was. What his job was, yeah. Yeah. That, that's critical. Because if your actors don't know what the story is, it's like when yeah, you're, you're lost. You're when lost. when you're on set, it's like the directors making one movie and the actors are making yeah, movie and it's yeah, or one actor's in one movie and another actor's in another. You know, that's so you you try to straighten that stuff out, um, and it's rehearsal, pretty simple. We we had uh, for our movie Normal Life, for example, two weeks of Luke Perry and Ashley Judd on a stage in a little storefront theater every day for two weeks mm -hmm. and our writers and John and I in the audience and every single word got scrutinized. And when something didn't work, it didn't sound like a human being or didn't sound like a couple and, you know, having this relationship, we'd look at the writers and they would straighten it out, you know? And that's yeah. another one of the reasons I always say it's the process of making that movie was, was one of the best. Um, <clears throat> we rehearsed Mad Dog and Glory. We rehearsed wild things. We didn't really rehearse, uh, the promotion enough. We didn't rehearse the harvest enough, and I can for, personally, I can see where the where that you can see the differences. Yeah, like where that affects it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm assuming that specifically affects the nuanced nuances of the care of the actors' performances. Yeah. Probably mostly. Sure. That's what you see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and they're, and they're, yeah, the relationship between the actors and the relationship the actors with the story. Yeah. And also, I mean, that, well, that's something that the, the read through is so big. That's something that is a constant in television, but it's in film. That's not always the case, but I feel like that's such an important tool to get yeah. everyone on the same page. Yep. It's all prep. Yeah. What? Gosh, you, I, I could, I, I, I could talk to you for hours. Honestly. This is, this you already been, have. <laughs> we already have two hours, and this is a lot of fun. Um, gosh, what, what are you working on right now? I, uh, so, I saw. Is, are you in like now transitioning to television now? You know, everybody's transitioning to television because that's where the money is, and that's where the jobs are, and that's where you know, uh, in a lot of ways, you know, long form 
well, what's 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 not better than being even more of what it is you're trying to do? Right. You know? uh, more I don't I don't have any um, working relationship with anybody in television in particular. So I, I you know, I, I there's a couple of things we're we've tried to do that are <laughs> yes, they would be television because they're long form. Uh, but the thing I'm <clears throat> the, the things I'm working on right now, there's a. a little thriller sort of revenge tale called Delilah that we're trying to cast right now. Um, is that, was that with the DePaul alum? No, the DePaul alum is, um, plain Jane, which, Got uh, it. um, you know, we, we're, we're, we've been trying to find, again, trying to find funding for that. Um, Delilah is being cast right now. That one we'll see if, if that goes, we have the thing, sex lives of Siamese twins, which is the Irvin Welsh. Right. Uh, script that again <clears throat> my um downside is that i'm not a fundraiser mm-hmm. so i don't have the um skill or the the necessary ability to be able to to shake money out of the industry mm-hmm. i uh, you know people always go can you can you help me make my movie and i go yeah you expect me to find money and they go yeah and i go you're you're barking up the wrong tree you know i i'm just not that's not in my skill set. Again, I think some of that falls back to being having come from the director's side. You know, it's about making it. Right. It's not about putting the deal together. I've again learned more about that, but still, I'm not. Uh, <clears throat> I don't go out and pitch movies in Hollywood to, to studios. Never done it. Been a part of my uh, work experience more than anything else. So I have a projects. I have to sort of rely on another producer or another entity to to get the, the funding part of it going. Yeah. Um, you know, I try somewhat, but, but uh, we haven't, uh, of the projects going now, one seems to be funded if we get the proper cast. Um, and a couple are just still out looking for uh, support to get, to get going. There's probably, I don't know, at, at any given point, there's five or six projects out there being, trying to get made. Is that, I mean, is that, do you think that's, a constant for you is always like five to six projects that at least, you got. Yeah, at, at least. least. Yeah. And they, they sort of rotate out. You forget all about one. And then all of a sudden one day, you, you know, I'll look in my, in my scripts or, or something, go, Oh yeah, wait a minute. You know, and it'll, it'll yeah. get more important again. It'll come to the top of the pile and, or you'll get some little piece of activity on one of them, you know, and, and you'll, you'll start to drive it again. Um. So at this point, all of these, all of these projects you're talking about, they could be films and they can't, and, or they could be television. No, um, the stuff that could be television, we were working on a, uh, we were working on a, the, the one about the, the taxi driver, which is not taxi, it's, it's not, a, but a, a cab driver who's an artist called yeah. Hack. <clears throat> that one was, was set up to be TV. Yeah. Um, we had a project about, um, a, a, a timbali player, Latin percussion guy who's brought over to America from Venezuela based on a true person who ended up sub, subbing for Tito Puente because Tito Puente hurt his elbow. And this guy came in and ultimately moved his whole family to New York City. And we had a family drama based on that uh, that we were trying to get set up. Um, those are both, <clears throat> those are the ones that are long form that I'm most. Uh, you know, that are strictly designed to be long form production. Mm. I know you talked, I know you talked to us specifically about Delilah in class. And I found that sort of very intriguing. Was it Del- Delilah or, or was it Plain Jane about the, uh... I think you talked about both of them. Yeah. I think yeah you Delilah also, you... is the one where, the, where a woman, um, a woman basically was her husband left her for a younger woman and she's, she plots revenge. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I I I remember that. Um, that's 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 so interesting because that's but that's kind of badass a little bit. Like you don't go out into Hollywood and pitch. It seems like these projects just kind of find you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and you know, there's and there's a there's a you know good and bad to that. The uh, uh, you know, they're, they're maybe a little less likely to happen, but again, Hollywood's a giant pool of, of projects. Uh, and here there's less, and there's also less 
producers or less people with whatever my skills happen to be. So I'm, you know, <clears throat> I get an opportunity sometimes to look at a project and say, and actually Delilah comes from the West Coast. There, those people are on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, but I get, you know, I, I get to see some things and if they're, if they're, they seem of reasonable quality and a good story, then I can get in, get involved. Yeah. Well, I thank you for doing that. This has been a very inspiring talk for me. Good. I'm very glad. I'm great thanks. stories. Thanks for honestly. having me. Yeah. I would, can I ask you though, one last question? I was going to yeah. wrap it up. Um, obviously I think the producers that are listening to this would love to hear your answer to this question. What, uh, what is something that you think has been, well, let me phrase it like this. What is something that you know now about producing that you think has helped you so much in your career that you wish you knew when you started this whole process? Uh, well, you know, what would be the answer to that? That, I mean, as simple and as stupid as it sounds, that to have a good story starting out, to have a good foundation, um, because, <clears throat> because then you know where you're, where you're going. Mm -hmm. if you and and i i you've heard me say this in class it it's a hard job it's not as it's not as important as you know many other professions the me, you know medicine or anything like that it's just not it's entertainment um but it's hard and it's physically hard it's you hard know? it's hard in different ways yeah, yeah. it's it, and it's physically it's you know when you're in production it's 15 hour days there's no getting around it for as, for you know wild things for us was 67 days that it's just hard work. So if you're going to do that kind of hard work, your picture can be shit or it can be great. You still have to do the hard work. So why not start out if you can, uh, especially in a creative position? It's not so much in crew is crew. They got to keep working. Creators, you know, you're going to spend just as much time on a crappy script and a crappy story as you are on a good one. That's true. So you got to try to be discerning about what you're going forward with. I mean, some people will make movies, especially in the small indies, just because they have a script, not because it's a good script. Well, we got a script, you know, that's just not the way to go about it. You got to have a, a good story and a good screenplay. So that's one less worry. You don't want to be worrying about that when you're in post, that your script sucked, or when you're in production, that your script sucked. I can't uh, but, even imagine that. <laughs> but quite often, and we've had it in our own experience, you're in the middle of production and you realize this just doesn't work at all. Why didn't we know this ahead of time? You know, again, it goes back to the, the, the place that would have been able to catch that if you didn't catch it in the writing process would have been in rehearsal. Right. You know, okay. This, this truly is not working and why and, and, and figure it out. So, so yeah. So my, what I didn't know going in was <laughs> and again, it's stupid that, you know, your foundation should be a really good story starting out, a really good screenplay starting out. It's going to, then you have more time to be creative and, and uh, polish your finished product as, as opposed to trying to fix it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the, the, you cannot, you cannot like over direct a bad script. No, like, you can't, you know, you can't I, I, save it yeah. direction. You yeah. can't save a bad script. You can't. No. Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Stephen Jones, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Welcome. Thanks for picking my brain. I know you had to use little tiny tools, but thanks very much. No, it, honestly, <laughs> it was this, it was very easy. It was, it was very yeah. fun to talk to. I I, en I enjoyed this a lot. So thank I did you too. So much. You well, take care of yourself. You too. I I can't wait to to see what is coming next, and I hope I get to talk to you sometime in the future. All right, you got my address. <laughs> got it, <laughs> man. Thank you so much. Sure.